In fact, of all 600 men that were over there uh, fighting uh, in other battles as well, 600 men were mobilized, 600 men returned home alive. This is called the miracle of Kapyang. Hello everyone, this is Mark Peterson with the uh, Frog Outside the Well Research Center. And today I'm going to be talking about a very special event that occurred in Korea 70 years ago, but occurred in Cedar City, Utah, just a few days ago on May 26th. Uh, the uh, event, the miracle of Kapyang was celebrated in Kapyang at the American Memorial there. Uh, and it was also celebrated in Cedar City, Utah at the Korean War Memorial. At the Cedar City meeting, the uh, mayor spoke and there was a uh, one star general, number two man in the Utah National Guard came to Cedar, Cedar City and spoke. And a retired uh, colonel in the, um, the, of the same unit that was in the Korean War also spoke. Uh, there was television coverage. A friend of mine told me I was on TV and we did this screen capture. I'm standing next to uh, Eugene Daly, who's the son of Colonel Daly, who is the commander of the Miracle Battalion. I'll tell you about it. There were uh, five companies, or they call them batteries, in the uh, 213th Armored Field Artillery Battalion that was mobilized to go to Korea to fight in the Korean War. You see these five cities, Fillmore, Richfield, Beaver, Cedar City, and St. George. Uh, at the time, the population was quite small. Fillmore was only 1,800 people. Richfield was 4,000 people. Beaver was 1,600. Cedar City was 6,000. And St. George was 4,500 people. And yet each of these uh, communities uh, provided 120 men, altogether 600 men to go fight in the uh, Korean War. Uh, these cities were small cities, 1950, uh, very much like this uh, photograph here. The uh, battalion uh, looked a lot like this. There's a picture in front of the old battalion headquarters. And there are about 90 men in this picture. So you figure each of these small towns provided 120 men. That's 30 more than you see in this photograph, uh, times five. And they sent them to Korea. And here is Kapyang off to the side in, in to the northeast of Seoul. Uh, it's about 60 miles outside of Seoul, almost to Chuncheon. Uh, and the uh, Kapyang has saw a lot of uh, action. It was uh, an important avenue into Seoul. And uh, here we can see where the Utah Monument is in red, but there's also a Canadian Australian monument. There was a monument to a student battalion that fought there. There's a monument to uh, the, the battles of the region of Kapyan. And just a little bit to the south, there's the Yongmun area battles museum or battles monument uh, commemorating a battle that took place just south of Kapyan. To understand the importance of Kapyan, uh, you need to understand that it was one of four avenues into Seoul. And here you can see the, the light line showing that's the valley bottom between the mountain ridges. Uh, and number four was the fourth avenue off to the east. Uh, one, two, and three lead straight into Seoul. But number four, you have to come down then take a turn to the left to get into Seoul. But it was, one, it was considered one of the four natural avenues through the mountain passes to get down into Seoul. So Kapyang was an important uh, defensive uh, line uh, to protect Seoul. So here are these uh, soldiers from Utah sent over to set up a camp and in the middle of the camp, there are refugees coming and going and all of the chaos of war. Uh, and they brought in their big guns, their big howitzers and their artillery that they would fire into the, into the night, into the day. Uh, they fired, the battalion fired 250,000 shells, a quarter of a million shells during the time of the Korean War, from the time they got there uh, in the fall of 50 
until uh, they left in uh, 53 at the end of the war. Here's a picture of uh, the Lieutenant Colonel, the commander of the battalion standing by one of his big guns. I'll tell you more about him. Uh, and let me tell you about the battle. One of the results of the battle was this, captured Chinese prisoners. The uh, Chinese invaded a surprise attack uh, at night uh, with 4,000 men, a brigade of uh, Chinese uh, army. And uh, as they attacked, the infantry in front of the artillery was uh, eliminated. S many were killed and many withdrew, leaving the artillery on the front line. Now, usually the artillery is in the back, shooting over the infantry to keep soldiers back away from the infantry, but the infantry disappeared. And here the, the soldiers came right on to the uh, artillery face to face. The artillery, uh, two batteries were uh, in location, two out of the five batteries, uh, 240 men facing 4,000 men in the middle of the night. And the uh, Utah battery just lowered their guns to point blank range and started firing and uh, pushed the Chinese back. One captain took 18 men and a motorized vehicle with a howitzer on it and a couple of machine guns and chased after the Chinese and captured uh, 830 of them. And here's a picture of the Chinese marching down through the, through the valley. So the, the battle, uh, as the Chinese got closer, the, the artillery uh, uh, fired point blank at the, at the uh, invading Chinese but they also needed to get out their rifles. And they found in the, in, in the aftermath that some of the Chinese got as close as 10 meters away. And there was a machine gun nest set up 40 meters away. And yet none of the American, uh, the Utah National Guard fell. Uh, this is largely attributed, attributed to the uh, leadership of Lieutenant Colonel Frank Daly. He was commander of this uh, uh, artillery battalion. And he took 600 men mobilized in his National Guard unit to fight in the Korean War. Uh, two batteries, 240 men were online the night of the attack when 4,000 Chinese attacked. They uh, killed, it turns out, 350 Chinese and captured 830. And when the Chinese started coming in close, they lowered their guns and shot point blank. Uh, almost 3,000 retreated, but 1,000 a little over a thousand were either killed or captured and they captured them by firing in front of them as they were retreating. So they had no place to go. They couldn't go forward, they couldn't go backward and they raised their hands and, uh, and surrendered. Uh, bottom line then was uh, 350 Chinese killed, 831 Chinese captured and not one American was killed. Not one member of the Utah National Guard was killed. In fact, of all 600 men that were over there uh, fighting uh, in other battles as well. 600 men were mobilized, 600 men returned home alive. This is called the miracle of Kapyong. And the credit for it goes to Lieutenant Colonel Daly. He was known as a man of prayer. He prayed every day for the correct strategy, the planning, and the safety of his men. He was like Jean Valjean in the famous musical Les Miserables where he sings the famous song, Bring Him Home. And he sings, God on high, hear my prayer. And that was the secret, the prayer of this uh, righteous commander who wanted to bring his men home. And this touches Mormon culture. In Mormon culture, if you read the Book of Mormon, there's a famous battle uh, about the army of Helaman. The story is 2,000 young men picked up their weapons to fight because their parents had sworn an oath never to fight again in the battles they had been in. And these 2,000 young men went out and were victorious in the battle. Every single one was wounded, but not one died. And when we tell this story of the 213th Field Artillery Battalion in the Korean War, and we say not one died, all came home. Uh, people who know Mormon culture say, oh, Army of Helaman. 
There's one other metaphor from Korean or from uh, Mormon culture, and that's the Mormon battalion. When the Mormons were driven out of Illinois, heading to Utah, in great pain and travail, crossing the plains without any provisions and uh, barely able to get wagons or, or uh, hand carts to cross the plains, the American government sent them a draft notice and said, we want you to go fight in the Mexican War. They didn't want to go, but there was money in it, and they were desperately poor. And so, so they accepted the challenge and organized the battalion, the Mormon battalion, and went to Mexico. When they got there, the war was over. The, fire had, the fighting had quit, and no one was killed. Those are the two analogous situations out of Mormon culture. Frank Daly knew most of the parents of these boys from small town, Southern Utah. And he said he didn't know how he could tell any of the parents that their son had been killed in the war. He wanted to bring them home alive. 600 were mobilized for the war, 600 returned home alive. This is the miracle of Kapyong. For his effort, uh, Colonel Daly was awarded the presidential um, unit citation by President Truman and a presidential unit citation by Syngman Rhee, one from the United States government, one from the Korean government. In remembrance of this, uh, the people of Kapyong sent a memorial stone to Cedar City just a few days ago for the commemorative celebration. And standing next to the monument is the mayor of Cedar City and the son and grandson of Frank Daly standing next to the monument. The miracle of Kapyong was one of the most lopsided battles in history. Not just the history of the Korean War and not just all of Korean history. There were analogous situations with Eastern Sheen and his naval battles where he fought some battles where sunk Japanese ships and not one of his soldiers was killed. And Uchi Munduk fought against the uh, uh, Chinese invaders and uh, had a great victory, a very lopsided victory where like 300,000 uh, Chinese were killed. Uh, but it, it falls into that category of Korean history. It's also one of the major lopsided battles in American history. And one of the most lopsided battles in all of military history, indeed of all of world history. Uh, 650 Chinese killed in action, 831 Chinese prisoners, no Utah deaths, no Utah prisoners. 600 went to war, 600 returned home alive. That's the story of the miracle of Kapyong. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Bye.